as Donald Trump delivers bottled water to thirsty Americans, Joe Biden delivers bags of cash to Ukraine. And doesn't that one sentence sort of say it all about the political moment we're currently living in? All the fake news performance artists keep saying this is a historic trip that Biden is taking, which is a weird way of describing it when a guy goes to a place he has been seven times in the last 14 years. Joe Biden going to Ukraine is about as historic as your Uncle Fred and Aunt Gladys going to Fort Lauderdale for the winter. Full disclosure, though, it has to be said, Biden has done something legitimately historic on this trip because today he became the first president ever to fall up the airplane stairs on two separate occasions. Very historic indeed. And naturally, if you get your information about the world from the mainstream fake news media performance artist sludge mongers, you're not going to see any coverage of Donald Trump delivering truckloads of bottled water to the folks in East Palestine. Because, let's face it, that's just about the last story that the mainstream news media would ever cover. They will do a deep dive on the truth of Elizabeth Warren's ethnic heritage before they report on Donald Trump performing any humanitarian acts of charity. And it goes without saying that Donald Trump is not currently an official of the U.S. government. While Joe Biden very much is that, which just makes this look even worse for Biden than it already looked last week. And there are actually two separate and distinct ways in which Biden and his administration have botched this incident just about as badly as a thing can be botched. On the one hand, it is a total failure of governance, because a town of 5,000 American taxpayers has been effectively left to its fate by the federal government to drink the poison water and breathe the poison air. And it's not like this was a difficult thing to respond to. FEMA and the NTSB and the Transportation Department, they've been doing this stuff for decades. The federal government goes in, they make sure everybody's been evacuated who needs to be evacuated, they make sure everybody has food and water and shelter and medical care and so on. But for reasons that remain unknown and which we can only guess at, none of the normal federal responses were witnessed in this case. But just as shockingly inexplicable as the governmental failure is the political failure. Joe Biden is supposed to be a president who is getting ready to kick off his re-election campaign. And the East Palestine incident afforded him a great opportunity to play the caring, empathetic conciliator-in-chief, the role presidents love playing more than any other role. Joe Biden should have been the guy passing out crates of bottled water, and he should have been doing it 12 or 14 days ago, but instead we've got Donald Trump, the private citizen, who takes it upon himself to spend his own time and his own money doing the thing the president is supposed to be doing. And just what the hell is going on in the minds of the people who run Joe Biden's political operation? They had to know that if Biden utterly ignored the people of East Palestine, as he has done, then of course Donald Trump was going to step in to fill the empathy vacuum and take the easy layup you guys have just given him, as he has done, because Donald Trump is not a fool. Also, if you're one of those people, like I saw this morning in various comment sections, saying, oh, this is just a Trump publicity stunt. He doesn't really care about these people. He's just doing this for a cheap photo op. If you're one of those people, I want you to take a step back and a nice deep breath and then answer me this question. What the hell does it matter? The man was giving water to thirsty people. That is just about as basic as charitable giving gets. And do you think the people of East Palestine give a single good goddamn if Trump is doing this legitimately out of charitable impulses or just for self-promotion? Spoiler alert, no, they don't. Why? Because they're thirsty and they need some freaking water to drink. When thirsty people need water and somebody gives it to them and your response is to attack the character of the guy giving out the free water? Maybe think twice next time before you presume to act like the moral high ground is your personal estate. Jim Eagle, hit the music, please. <laughs> From high atop the battlements of Castle Curmudgeon, where the water will quench your thirst and put hair on your chest. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all ships at sea. Welcome to the program. I'm your eponymous host and humble servant. And I want to talk tonight about people, Republicans in particular, who don't seem to have any idea what decade they are living in. And I, I want to begin 
by playing the campaign kickoff video that Nikki Haley put out the other day. Nikki Haley, of course, is the former South Carolina governor and UN ambassador who has just thrown her tiara into the ring as Donald Trump's first challenger for next year's GOP nomination. And as you watch the video, or even better yet, just listen to it with your eyes closed. I want you to ask yourself, does this sound like a commercial for a presidential candidate or a commercial for a hospice care facility? The railroad tracks divided the town by race. I was the proud daughter of Indian immigrants. Not black, not white. I was different. But my mom would always say your job is not to focus on the differences, but the similarities. And my parents reminded me and my siblings every day how blessed we were to live in America. Some look at our past as evidence that America's founding principles are bad. They say the promise of freedom is just made up. Some think our ideas are not just wrong, but racist and evil. Nothing could be further from the truth. I have seen evil. In China, they commit genocide. In Iran, they murder their own people for challenging the government. And when a woman tells you about watching soldiers throw her baby into a fire, it puts things in perspective. Even on our worst day, we are blessed to live in America. I was born and raised in South Carolina, so I have seen the very best of our country. People here threw out the old, tired political establishment and demanded accountability for their tax dollars. Industry reports called us the beast of the Southeast, which I love. People came by the thousands for fresh starts. Moms and dads held their heads up high. Children learned that it was always it's a great day in South Carolina. It's a great day. It's a great day. A great day. A great day in South Carolina. We were strong. We were proud. And when evil did come. Police in South Carolina are looking for a gunman following a shooting at a church. Several in victims. Charlotte. We don't know the uh, severity. We turned away from fear toward God and the values that still make our country the freest and greatest in the world. We must turn in that direction again. Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven out of the last eight presidential elections. That has to change. Joe Biden's record is abysmal, but that shouldn't come as a surprise. The Washington establishment has failed us over and over and over again. It's time for a new generation of leadership to rediscover fiscal responsibility, secure our border, and strengthen our country, our pride, and our purpose. Some people look at America and see vulnerability. The socialist left sees an opportunity to rewrite history. China and Russia are on the march. They all think we can be bullied, kicked around. You should know this about me. I don't put up with bullies. And when you kick back, it hurts them more if you're wearing heels. I'm Nikki Haley, and I'm running for president. Now, if you fell asleep and didn't catch all that, don't feel bad. Most everybody else probably did, too. And those who made it through the entire thing may be saying, I'm not sure I want to vote for her for president, but, but if you give me the address of that hospice care facility, she can totally be my granny's night nurse. And, and my God, this thing is already cringe-inducing enough as it is without the awful maudlin piano music that's straight out of a big pharma commercial and, and making the centerpiece of the video be a church shooting just so you can very implicitly, in a very subtle way, issue the obligatory disclaimer that says, well, I'm not a racist like those other Republicans. But when she gets to that line right toward the end of the, of the video that says, that line that says, and when you kick them back, it hurts more when you're wearing heels. 
What what kind of nauseating 1990s girl power bullshit is that? Who is it for? Who is who is supposed to be impressed by it? It sounds like something you would hear in a woman's deodorant commercial when it's 1994 and Beverly Hills 90210 just ended and you're waiting for Melrose Place to start. Right in between a, a crisp crystal pepsi commercial and a commercial for some personal hygiene product with extreme in the name so sure if it's 25 or 30 years ago and you're a female republican politician trying to attract a base of support this would be a perfectly adequate campaign kickoff video maybe say a few throwaway lines about lower taxes and small government and bob's your uncle that's all you need but here in the year 2023 when the voters look around and see their public schools have been turned into meat markets for pedophiles and child groomers, when you can't walk down the street in the average American city without being accosted, or worse, by some vagrant drug addict, when it's well nigh impossible to start a small business or to save for retirement, when the country is being overrun by Joe Biden's five million illegal aliens, when there's a toxic waste spill in your town and you can't even rely on the U.S. government for a fucking bottle of water? The 90s ended, Nikki Haley. They ended quite a hell of a long time ago, in fact. And this message you're trying to base your presidential campaign on? It is not language that any conservative voter in the year 2023 is going to find compelling. But then, it does make sense that Nikki Haley would want to package herself as a 1990s Republican because that is exactly what she is. She is the kind of Republican who doesn't want to offend anybody, always wants to stay in the good graces of the news media, and for whom conservatism means some tired old bumper sticker slogans about low taxes and small government, and smiling politely while your side loses every single battle in the culture war for upwards of three decades. Which... You could get away with all that stuff 25 or 30 years ago, but that school of republicanism, it died. And Donald Trump is the man who killed it dead. Nikki Haley, I guess she didn't get the memo. Mike Pence also didn't get the memo. And there are other prominent squish Republicans who also didn't get the memo who think they can put the Trump genie back into the bottle and go back to the world they used to like so well where Republicans were just supposed to lose while smiling politely and mouthed the requisite catchphrases about lower taxes and small government long enough to win the election, and then, then they can get down to the real work of massively expanding the federal bureaucracy and using it to cudgel you into submission. Because that's the sort of conundrum that these 1990s Republicans find themselves in. Your Nikki Haley's and your Mike Pence's and your Willard Romney's and so on. They fooled their voters for many, many years, longer than should have been possible with, with the small government low taxes talk, and it took Donald Trump, the proverbial bull in the china shop, to come along and slap the voters across the face and say, what the hell is wrong with you idiots? You vote for Republicans who say they're going to lower your taxes and shrink the government, only to watch them raise your taxes and grow the government every single time, and yet you keep taking their word for it. But stop! They are lying! Show some self-respect for once, why don't you? George W. Bush got himself elected in 2000 on that same standard script. I am a low-tax, small-government conservative, and I am a non-interventionist on foreign policy. But by the halfway point of his first term, he had authored the biggest expansion of the federal government since the New Deal. By the end of his first term, he had started two foreign wars for good measure. So it comes time to plan the re-election campaign. And W says, oh, shoot, fellas, my conservative bona fides ain't looking too great here. I've massively expanded the government. I have launched multiple open-ended blank check foreign military adventures. But you know what I haven't done? Haven't raised taxes. In fact, I think if we push through a tax cut through the Congress before this election, that would rehabilitate my conservative credentials and I wouldn't have to worry about losing to my opponent. What's his name? You know, the, the fellow who's the, the president of the Narrow Birth Canal Club and also a member. John Kerry. That's it. I knew it would come to me eventually. So George W. and his band of merry miscreants get it into their heads that it would be just a stupendous idea to do a big old tax cut while expanding the government, while fighting multiple foreign wars. And you don't need to be a fancy professional economist to figure out, wait, here? 
Isn't it kind of a bad idea to decrease revenue while massively increasing spending? Isn't that how businesses go out of business by doing such things? And the answer is yes, of course. But never let rationale and good judgment stand in the way of political expediency, goddammit. Especially when there's an election to be won. And what did we, the citizenry, get out of that whole deal? We got a collapsed economy and a Barack Obama presidency. So, great work, W. You're doing a heck of a job. Heck of a job. I think we, we need a better bit of descriptive shorthand for these types of Republicans, the ones in the Nikki Haley, Mike Pence, Willard Romney, George W. Bush mold. And with that in mind, I propose that we call them, henceforth, paleo publicans. I think it's got kind of a nice ring to it. Let me know in the comments if you approve or disapprove or have a better idea, or if you just want to remark on how ruggedly handsome I am. But there's also another kind of idiot Republican I want to talk tonight, and this group happens to include my own idiot Republican congressman, but it, it's going to require another brief bit of video, and this one is from N MSNBC, so I do apologize in advance for that. After President Biden's historic trip to Kiev yesterday, members of the Republican Party have been struggling to stay on message. The president's secret trip here allowed him to frame the narrative in a way that some Republicans have had difficulty responding to. Most of the oxygen got sucked up by the party's extreme MAGA fringe, who called on the United States to halt any additional aid to Ukraine. And that puts the less chaotic Republicans in the conference, who do believe that there's bipartisan consensus on funding Ukraine, in a difficult position. They're facing pressure from both Democrats and fellow Republicans. So today, a group of the less chaotic Republicans, including the Congressman Michael McCall of Texas, who's the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, made the trip here to Kiev themselves. They literally retraced President Biden's steps. They even tried to one-up the president by calling on the U.S. to provide additional artillery and F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine, something that the Biden administration has so far been reluctant to do. The president recently visited, and, and uh, I commend him for uh, coming here, and it's a very symbolic uh, move on his part. We have strong bipartisan support to give Ukraine everything that it needs to win. I will be a very strong voice on uh, both the attack arms, the long-range artillery to hit the Iranian drones in Crimea, in addition to the F-16s. I'm seeing increasing momentum towards getting both the artillery and the planes in. Now, these idiots, I would submit, are engaged in a different mode of comically outdated 1990s Republican thought, where all you had to do to earn voter support was dress yourself up and up in some woodland camouflage and say a bunch of things about guns and war and stuff. Conservative voters love that shit, right? So Joe Biden goes to Kiev, that's Kiev, two syllables, and these five idiot Republicans say, hey, that's no fair. We're supposed to be the party that does all the war stuff. This aggression will not stand. So they all go out and buy a bunch of brand new woodland camo gear and within 48 hours they're posing and preening all around Kiev. And look, I'm no fancy military strategist or anything. I ain't got no fancy book learning. I'm just a simple man making his way in the universe. So I would very much appreciate it if someone who is an expert on these matters could explain to me what benefit is conferred upon the wearer by donning woodland camouflage gear in an urban environment. But then, they didn't put nearly that much thought into this, did they? We have got an important trip to do some important war posturing, and damn it, we will look so much cooler and more warlike if we all wear camo gear and cosplay like we're, like we're, like we're soldiers and stuff. And then here again, we are right back to the mainstream of 1990s Republican thought, where any sort of military posturing is good and virtuous and a worthwhile thing. I mean, after all, what is it conservative voters want? They want lots of empty rhetoric about low taxes and small government, and they want their congressmen dressing up in woodland camo and posing with guns. Boom, election over, we win. Right? Isn't that the way this is all supposed to work? And you have to go all the way back to the very beginning of the 1990s to trace the roots of that particular phenomenon, which has its origins, ultimately, in the national guilt that we felt, and not without reasonable cause, over the way some of us abused and mistreated our servicemen who re were returning home from the Vietnam War. Vietnam ends in terms of active combat operations in 1972. The last of our personnel come home in 1975. And we don't fight any wars for the next 15 years, not until Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait 
in August of 1990, and President George H.W. Bush says, this aggression will not stand. This aggression against Kuwait, it will not stand. The UN authorizes the use of military force in inject ejecting the invader. Our troops start getting ready to deploy overseas, and within a matter of about 17 minutes, every store in every mall in the United States has racks upon racks of merchandise saying, support our troops, desert storm, bomb Saddam. It was all completely absurd and pretty embarrassing in retrospect for those of us who participated in it. I was only 16 at the time, but I'm not going to give myself a free pass here. But there's no difficulty in figuring out where it came from. We hated ourselves for having treated our boys badly when they came home from the last war, so we decided we were going to overcompensate it by comically overcompensating in our support for the next war, because that's what you do when you get a thing wrong. You wildly overcorrect in the opposite direction, and that magically absolves you of all your previous sins. So you never have to feel guilty about any of that Vietnam stuff ever again, just as long as you are dutifully wearing your Desert Storm t-shirt and rocking an I Support the Troops bumper sticker on your Toyota MR2. But the moral of the story is the same for these five idiot congressmen as it is for Nikki Haley. And that moral is, nobody cares about this crap anymore. The 90s ended. They ended a long time ago. There is literally not one single conservative voter in this country who is going to watch a video of you jackasses posing up a storm in downtown Kiev in your matching woodland camo three-quarter zip pullovers and think, gosh, I am really impressed by what these men are doing following Joe Biden to Ukraine like a bunch of sad little puppies to give the stamp of personal approval to his proxy war with Russia? So brave, so principled, so conservative. Seriously, the only voters who are going to approve of the antics of these five GOP congressmen are Democrat voters, because Democrats are the pro-war party now. I feel like everybody should have gotten this memo, but evidently not. Some people insist, permanently it seems, on partying like it's 1999 and more power to him, frankly, because if his opponents are all in the mold of squishy globalist neoliberal virtue signalers like Nikki Haley, then the Republican debates in 2024 are going to be even more entertaining than they were in 2016, and Trump is going to wipe the floor with his opponents just as badly as he did with those poor bastards, low-energy Jeb and little Marco. That is it for me tonight. Thank you very much indeed for watching.